Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for inviting us, uh, me and Bea as well, to talk to you a little bit about our work in LGBT psychology in the Philippines. Um, as a psychologist, um, I'm very interested in how people are doing. So before I go with my presentation, I just wanted to do a quick survey. Just in this scale, this one simple question, which, of, uh, which face comes closest to how you're feeling this afternoon? And I have a very simple scale. I don't like the complicated strongly agree, strongly disagree kind of scale. So these are just faces from one. Uh, for, you have one there, which is the happiest, and then seven is the not so happy, and everything in between. Can you just shout out to me your answer? Okay, I heard a lot of twos and maybe some ones and maybe even some other numbers there as well. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. The last one. Ah, right. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you now about what about your love life? Now, but before, I, before we answer, um, this is a question about quality, not quantity. Right? So we, we won't be able to tell whether you're in a relationship or not based on your answer here. Because as you know, we have some people, we know some people who are single but perfectly happy and people who are partnered but not very happy at all. So with that little caveat, can you shout to me your answer? Okay, I heard a couple of ones and twos. I heard some six and sevens. We can talk after during the break. Now, what about, if I ask about your love life, I think I have to ask about, oh my gosh, your sex life. I think we know some, some jokes about atheism and sex, I think, would be appropriate to insert here. Again, not about amount or frequency, <laughs> but satisfaction and quality. Answer, please. I hear a lot of fours. <laughs> Maybe there should be some more social events after the convention. <laughs> I think I saw some free condoms outside as well. Um, what about, oh my God, your financial life? Oh no. Again, doesn't tell us about the level, but tells us because we know some people who lead a very simple, you know, material life and they're perfectly happy, whereas others, you know, try to amass things and they're not very happy. Answer? Eight. Eight. <laughs> Eight. Uh, it's beyond my scaling. I love it. Um, what about if we put all of that together? What about life as a whole? Let's say, for example, there is going to be an, like a, an asteroid coming tomorrow and this is going to be our last day. No, oh, oh, atheism ends the world um, in a convention. Um, how would you look back and what you've done so far? Um, and just summarize that for me. Your answer would be? One, two, the four, etc. So it could be the same, it could be different. Um, I ask this question because this question is related to something that psychologists care about, which is called well-being. Um, and if you answered uh, in my questions one, two, or three, then that means that um, your well-being, your, at least the subjective aspects of your well-being, are doing okay. And if not, then we can talk about how to improve your well-being to make it closer to... Uh, maybe uh, sorry, not closer, but closer to one, one or two. If you're going, if you're starting from this side of the scale, um, well-being is a concern of uh, all psychologists, and we're concerned as well with the well-being of all people, men, women, uh, believers, non-believers, young, old. And, and uh, for this afternoon, I want to talk to you a little bit about our work uh, trying to promote the well-being of sexual and gender minorities. Uh, how to get them to answer one, two, or three. So I just wanted to kind of uh, move a little bit and connect that to what I mean by LGBT. All right? So it's always good to start with that quick alphabet. Um, just as a recap, I know some of you here are very active as well in LGBT rights work. Um, and some uh, might, uh, this might be a good opportunity to also kind of level off on what we mean by this, these terms. Well, what does the, let's start in the back. I, it's sometimes it's more fun to start in the back, right? Um, let's start with the T. What does the T in LGBT stand for? Transgender, transgender. So a formal definition would be men and women whose sex, the, the sex that their doctor or their nurse or practitioner told them. That. 
Uh, Transgender means meaning moving from one side of the gender binary to the other. No? So from moving from male to female or female to male. And this is a good friend of mine, uh, Gina Rosero, and she is a transgender Filipina model based in New York. What about L, lesbian? Uh, so women who form partnerships, uh, fall in love no, with other women. Uh, G for gay, uh, men who form intimate relations or partnerships with other men. You know, one of our favorite gay couples here in the Philippines. And then B or bisexual, which are, are referred to men and women who are romantically attracted and form relationships with either men or with women. You know? um, and uh, we've often received questions from students and uh, other people in the public who ask, do you have to be equally attracted to men or women to, to, be, bi to be considered bisexual? And we want to reassure them that, no, it's okay. You don't have to be equally attracted to men or women. It's not like it's, you have to be, like let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, girls, and then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, boys, and then Sunday, no one. <laughs> Rest day. <laughs> exactly. Um, you still get your membership card. You will still get your membership card even if it's not that kind of way. Um, uh, in the past, um, people would, would come up to me after my talks and say, Eric, you always talk about inclusion, but you never, you always just talk about being LGBT. You never talk about heterosexuality. So I have this slide here that I'm, I'm including now about heterosexuality, which refers to men who are attracted to women or women who are attracted to men. And for, um, if you're not familiar with uh, the Philippine politi political situation, these are some famous heterosexuals that have um, graced our... But it's fine, it's normal. It's, there's nothing psychologically wrong with being that way. It's okay, yeah, it's okay, yeah, yeah. Good job, straight people, good job. <laughs> um, so not all LGBT people identify as LGBT and actually LGBT is just our convenient way uh, to kind of refer to gender minorities like transgender people and sexual minorities like uh, LGB people. Um, and even in the Philippines, you probably will not, you not commonly encounter terms like LGBT. I've, you don't really hear of people saying, um, like for example, to go at home, mom, ma, I have to tell you something. Uh, what, anak, ano, what, what are you gonna tell me? I'm LGBT. Um, and their mom's like, um, that's like four things. Which one are you talking about? Um, so we don't usually use that term in our, necessarily in our personal lives, but for political and analytic purposes, it's quite useful. What LGBT people in the Philippines and in many parts of the world, though, have in common is probably experiences of stigma. Um, the devaluation or the uh, lower status, uh, discrimination, etc., in society. And this is from a... Uh, one of our local children's books, uh, Ikaklit sa Aming Hardin. Um, it's a bilingual children's book that talks about the experiences of a girl uh, who has two lesbian moms and how she, even though she's not lesbian herself, she experiences stigma at school. Um, all over the world, uh, anti-LGBT stigma is a persistent problem in many places in the world. It's actually a criminal offense to be gay and in five countries, uh, as well as some parts of, I think, Nigeria um, and Iraq, you can actually get the death penalty. Um, and in the Philippines, uh, this has been a problem. We thought this wasn't particularly a big problem, what we call state-sponsored homophobia. Uh, but later on in, in the presentation, I'll tell you a little bit about um, an experience we had uh, with the government when it comes to uh, homophobia. Uh, so Anti-LGBT stigma is usually taken to be uh, instrumentalized or institutionalized along three institutions in society. So one is the state, you know, a state as a sort of instrument for homophobia. The other, of course, you're very familiar with is religion. And this is a photo from one of our, uh, the Manila Pride Parade. I think this is from maybe 2010, maybe, where you have uh, a bunch of... Um, uh, faith-based groups, uh, you know, throwing a wrench into the what is usually a very fun parade, um, and carrying around signs like these. 
I was telling a friend of mine about this in the English department in our university, and he says, um, you know, Eric, the homophobia I can handle, but the grammar is um, uh, it's a bit problematic. And I was telling a friend of mine from our um, fine arts department, and she says, you know, Eric, the homophobia I can handle, but the Christmas colors and the capital letters, I think the gays need to give them a workshop. So maybe that's what we can do as a sort of offering to the community. Um, and then, of course, the third sort of um, institutional field that has uh, done the LGBT community a lot of wrong in the past, uh, psychology, psychiatry, and the mental health professions. Um, this is actually a textbook, in, a locally published textbook in child psychology. Uh, it says, protect your child from homosexual tendencies. Uh, to some degree, the cause of homosexual tendencies can be associated with wrong companions. Um, and they actually identify the recipe, at least in a boy, no? Um, in, uh, uh, over intimate, overprotective, emotionally smothering mother, and detached, hostile, or indifferent father. It's very Freudian, it's very Freudian. Close, close binding, overly possessive, puritanically domineering father may trigger the emotionally psychological conditions that will produce homosexual tendencies in a girl. Of course, nothing about bisexuality or being transgender, because those are just footnotes in their world. Um, when, because of this, uh, what we call pathologization, or rendering something into an illness, when you render something, an illness, into, something an, something into an illness like homosexuality, uh, it, creates, it creates a cascade of negative outcomes. For example, suddenly people become curious about what causes homosexuality or what makes people gay. Um, even though nobody really asks the question, what makes people heterosexual or uh, straight? Um, there's a lot of worry about contagion. No? Um, if you hang around with enough gay people, will you get the gay? Uh, if you watch enough uh, television of certain shows, will, will that influence you? There's some talk about cures as well. And even more, generally more stigma, especially the stigma that's associated with mental illness. This, of course, changed in 1973. Um, in 1973, it's a really interesting year. That was the year the American troops pulled out of Vietnam. That was the, the number one song, at least on, in the Billboard charts at the time, was, I, I don't know if you know this song, it's by Roberta Flack. It's called Killing Me Softly With His Song. Do you guys like that song? Yeah, it's a really nice song. The, the second song for that year in the Billboard charts was uh, Tie a Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree. I mean, apparently those are really old songs. Um, uh, and then for the Philippines, that was an interesting year because that was the year that uh, we won the Miss Universe <laughs> beauty pageant for the second time where you had a five foot six inch stunner named Margie Moran who won that big beauty pageant. That was also the year that uh, homosexuality was removed, uh, well, actually 42 years ago, that was removed from uh, our Manual of Disorders, uh, called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, published by the American Psychiatric Association. So that's been 42 years that uh, homosexuality, sorry for that, uh, has been removed and depathologized officially uh, in the DSM and in psychology and psychiatry. This uh, was affirmed later on by the World Health Organization in 1992, again, more than 20 years ago, and by various uh, associations in uh, Western as well as non-Western countries. So in other words, there's actually no particular pathology that is associated with same-sex sexualities. Um, and that's just really love if you think about it. Um, and some recent updates as well for people who are interested in uh, transgender health. Uh, the latest DSM, now the DSM-5, has actually removed gender identity disorder from that list, and there's now a call for sensitive care for transgender people. So which brings me to the field where, um, th that I really represent. So I, uh, this is the class that I teach at the university, and a lot of my research has been involved in this area, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender psychology. It's a different kind of psychology from the pre-1973 psychology. It's a kind of psychology that looks at LGBT people's experiences in positive and affirming and non-stigmatizing ways. 
Um, like any kind of psychology, it is empirical and evidence-based. Um, but we have sort of a more social justice orientation, which I think we share with a lot of humanist and atheist groups as well. So just to kind of recap, before 1973, if someone was labeled homosexual, then um, psychologists like me would automatically assume that they had poor mental health or equate that to poor mental health. And that's called what we call a pathologization model. That kind of changed now and we've evolved in our thinking. So we now are highly focused on things like well-being and we recognize things that are uh, contributive to the lowering of well-being. So for example, I, I list down some possible stressors here. For example, major life events. For example, losing your job or moving to a new job or moving house or migrating or getting married or one of your children you know, graduates from school and, and you know, starts a new family or there's a death in the family, etc. Hassles. Hassles are small things that stress us out. You know, you couldn't find the location of the, you know, the, the, the venue of the, con the convention. Um, you, you, the ATM, the, the cash machine ran out of money. It suddenly started raining even though we're in a tropical country and it's supposed to be summer. Um, you've run out of um, money to, uh, to pay for your taxi fare, etc. Illness, overload, noise, money problems, conflict, breakups, negative people. Do you know, are there some people in your life where you, you, know, you kind of just see them walking, coming, coming towards you and you start feeling stressed out. Suddenly, it's suddenly very cold. It's kind of getting dark here. Um, very dementor-ish sort of people in our lives. So those are called normative stressors because they stress everyone out. Whether you're a man or a woman, you're LGBT or you're non-LGBT, uh, you're a theist or you're an atheist, these all stress everybody out. Except that for LGBT people, there's another stressor that adds to that, which is called stigma. Um, being part of a stigmatized group in society, um, to feel othered, to feel kind of different or on the margins or in the periphery, negatively impacts well-being. Um, there's now a lot of studies that have shown that many LGBT people face um, this stigma, which translates into poor outcomes, um, both for their mental health, and now we have evidence as well for negative impacts on physical health. Uh, there are a bunch of researchers in the US now who are also uh, seeing economic uh, negative impacts. So, in very anti-LGBT contexts, for example, you can think of the same countries uh, where there's probably a lot of blasphemy laws and it's not a very LGBT-friendly place. Um, the impact of stigma is very high on people's well-being outcomes. In tolerant contexts, for example, I would say in, in some parts here in the Philippines, uh, considered quite tolerant for a Southeast Asian country, the impact of stigma is a little bit smaller. Uh, and if you have contexts that are very LGBT friendly or LGBT affirmative, the impact of stigma tends to be very, very small. So I'm thinking here about, for example, uh, well-documented cases in uh, Scandinavian countries. Um, recently, we heard about the case of Ireland becoming maybe a little bit less stigmatized there because of their changes in the marriage equality laws. These are the places where Stigma is so um, far removed from daily experience that we just have to now deal with the general normative stressors of life. Uh, as some LGBT activists would say, we just want the rights to the same happiness and to the same sadness. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, I want to summarize this part from a quote from a very popular Filipino TV show that was popular uh, about two years ago called My Husband's Lover. If for, for the people who are not from the Philippines, it's a very, it's a, it's a telenovela, it's a sort of primetime soap opera where um, a woman has to deal with the fact that her husband has a male lover um, who was actually his ex-boyfriend years ago. And in that storyline, uh, one of the gay characters um, goes to see a psychologist. And we were so excited because I think it was the first time to see a psychologist on national TV. Um, <laughs> and so he, he goes to the psychologist asking, you know, I, I think I'm gay. Um, what should I do? 
Um, and he even brings, it's very Filipino, he actually brings his mom along when he goes to see his therapist, um, which is oddly very Freudian as well. Um, and then she basically says, your son is normal, depathologization. He is just being treated as abnormal by the people around him, minority stress or stigma. Um, our argument in our work in local psychology is this, that if in the past psychology has uh, contributed to the harm against LGBT people, it can also contribute to positive change. And I want to tell you a little story about how we've been doing that. Okay, this is not working. Okay, all right. So um, in 2011, sorry, I'm going to move a few slides. Um, in 2011, our National Association came up with a policy statement on non-discrimination. This is the first statement of its kind by a professional organization in Asia, followed very closely by Hong Kong uh, a few months later, um, where we talked about um, how psychologists and psychology in general in the Philippines uh, should not discriminate against LGBT people. Um, since then, we've done uh, a bit of advocacy work. We supported the uh, anti-discrimination ordinance in Cebu City. Um, recently in Quezon City, uh, our work has also been cited by uh, lawmakers trying to advance that policy. Even though there's a lot of uh, steps that need to be done. In this map, you see that um, only, only the red uh, areas in the region, in the country, have uh, policies that protect against discrimination. In other words, in most parts of the country, you could lose your job if you happen to be gay or lesbian, and there's no, you just, that's, that's life. You know? We don't have an anti-discrimination law. Okay, I'm losing some of my slides. Um, a lot of our work has been focused um, uh, within the vehicle of what we call the LGBT Psychology Special Interest Group of the Psychological Association of the Philippines. Uh, we are the first collective of psychologists and mental health professionals in the region who are working for LGBT rights and well-being. Uh, we, many of us come from Metro Manila, but are from all over the country, uh, both from, interestingly, from secular schools as well as from non-secular schools, as well as people in private practice. Uh, this is, these are some pictures from our uh, participation in the Pride Parade. Um, some of our work has also focused on trying to send out the message um, about conversion therapy or so-called conversion therapy. Uh, in the Philippines, the case for conversion therapy is a bit complicated um, because it is usually provided within the framework of a faith-based kind of service. Uh, but because psychologists uh, and our work are really secular, um, we have a little bit of difficulty going into are challenging it head on. So we're trying to provide um, spaces to have that discussion, you know, an alternative to those efforts to promote uh, and harm especially young people with that idea that's, that you know, their identity and, and their love is uh, pathological or somehow wrong. Um, I just gave you a little bit of slice of the kind of work that we do, um, so I would love to talk to you a little bit more about that uh, during the open forum. Um, but I hope that if I ask you this question now, um, how you're feeling um, after our lunch, after all the inspiring talks you've heard this afternoon and the more inspiring talks you'll hear this, this afternoon, this morning, this afternoon, how would you answer this question? Um, I hope you'd answer it as one, two, or three. And I hope that we can work together so that we can make sure that uh, non-believers and believers, LGBT people and non-LGBT people in the Philippines and in other parts of the world, if they answer this question of ours, they will all answer one, two, or three. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Eric uh, Manalastas. Okay, so we've got questions here right now. And the first one being, do you think being a gay slash lesbian slash bisexual is a matter of choice? or by genes, or what? Wow, thank you for that very interesting question. Um, before I answer that, my colleague Bea is probably gonna go with our, with our brochure so that if you need more information about our work, uh, you have something to take home. Um, it's a very interesting question. Uh, why are some people straight and why are some people gay? 
Um, the quick answer that I can give you is, according to the research, we don't know. <laughs> and I think partly the reason for the we don't know is, um, to be honest, that, that question is not very interesting anymore to scientists. Um, a lot of the work that we are doing research-wise is trying to document and figure out how we can make the world better for LGBT people. And maybe finding out where being LGBT comes from is not really, has been, not really been part of that equation. Uh, there is a bit of research, though, I should say, that comes from the more biological aspects of psychology. For example, there is a big study that came out of Australia that looked at the correlation between uh, being gay or lesbian and handedness. And they found a correlation between being left-handed and being lesbian or gay. So that more left, if you're left-handed, you're more likely to be lesbian or gay. Or if you're lesbian or gay, you're more likely to be left-handed. Because it's a correlational study, we don't know what the hell is going on. We don't even know what it means. Um, handedness is something biological. It's there before you were born. So does that mean that your sexual attractions are there as well before you were born? Um, it's an intriguing study. But at the end of the day, you know, when people are not are losing their jobs or not being able to go home to the people they love, I think, you know, our our the, the efforts that we have have been kind of focused on that. I wish I could tell you a quick answer, but the quickest answer is really actually we don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. So for our, our uh, for the next question coming from our uh, audience. Uh, are LGBT part of the evolution? Evolution didn't stop 2,000 years ago. I'm not an evolutionary biologist, um, so I can't really speak very expertly on evolutionary processes. Um, although there is a part of psychology that is, has dealt with the evolution of mecha psychological mechanisms. I think one of the basic steps when you're trying to establish if something is an evolved mechanism is to try to document if it exists in the human species across different cultures. And um, for being LGBT, that has been shown, that there, are, there is evidence for same-sex uh, pair bonding across all known cultures, or most, if not all known cultures, and across various times in our history. I don't know if that is an evolved process. Um, I think it's just being human. I don't know if that is evolutionary per se. Um, but there is some discussion on that. It's not very convincing though. There is a hypothesis that uh, gay people tend to uh, be more nurturing towards their family members. And that could be one reason why, you know, if you have a sister and you're a bisexual man, you have a sister, she has children. Technically, her offspring share some of your genetics. So maybe, maybe it sounds a bit far-fetched to me, but I'm not an evolutionary expert. So maybe we should invite a biologist next time. Thank you. Here's another question from one of the, uh, one of the uh, audience members. How do you feel about the recent Eat Bulaga skit where the gay father was told to get back to the closet? Given that it's a comedy show, do you think the backlash was overkill? Right. Um, this is a. Uh, I think this is the. If, this is a the case of a. There was a. There's a popular noontime show uh, in the Philippines called Eat Bulaga. Um, and it, incidentally, one of the one of the uh, performers or entertainers and that happens to be one of our most highly esteemed senators. Um, Recently, there was that case where uh, a gay father came on to the show um, and uh, the hosts in the show basically told him to go back to being in the closet uh, as their kind of advice. I think they said it in a kind of humorous way because the show, I think, tends to play on, particular, on a particular sense of humor. Um, from a psychological perspective, that's not... That's not what we would say. We would say that there's a lot of studies that show that LGBT people make for terrific parents just as good. And there are even some studies that show that sometimes they can even be better than heterosexual parents, particularly in raising children who are, um, who have, who are free from gender roles. Uh, so I don't think it's necessary to go back into the closet to become a good parent. A good parenting basically just involves two things, warmth and autonomy support. 
supporting children in their choices and in their potentials, and then being caring and nurturing and warm. Those are the two ingredients, according to family psychology, that are important for parenting. And uh, I don't think men or women or gay people or straight people have a monopoly on those characteristics. Awesome. Next question from a member of our audience. Do you think that homophobia should be included in the DSM or, yeah, be classified as a mental disorder? Are you saying we should use pathologization against the enemy? Hmm, I wish we could do that. I wish we could call, you know, for example, religious fundamentalism as a disorder. Um, <laughs> wouldn't that be fun? Um, it, it's a, it, it tickles the mind, but I think at the end of the day, uh, we should be very careful with using pathologization as an instrument or tool. <laughs> um, we don't want... There are people are out there who are going to, for example, things like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorders, etc. And it using pathologization as a way to, you know, to uh, stigmatize those whom we don't agree with is probably not a very good strategy. Uh, it's it's just unfortunate, however, that the term homophobia has evolved that way. That it has the word phobia. It's actually not. There's nothing fear. There's no necessarily fear. It's not necessarily fear-based. If anything, it's actually probably either disgust or anxiety or awkwardness because you don't know, you think you don't know what LGBT people are like or possibly anger because you think that LGBT people are taking away, taking away from your rights or changing your the fundamental values in society. So it's not really a phobia. That's why sometimes the term that we use in, in our work is homonegativity homo negative or simply stigma anti lgbt stigma because it's not just homophobia it's also biphobia and transphobia as well i'd have to agree with you on that because that's more exact than what is yeah homo negativity if you want that also opens the door for homo positivity so cool it creates a new discourse so uh, there's another question here uh, if a lesbian or gay person turns out to be converted to his heterosexuality generally is he she is true to his her uh converting or con yeah converting conversion right so i'm i'm gonna just gonna answer that as um is is it really possible to convert right um i think it's actually probably easier to convert maybe religiously <laughs> rather than to convert in terms of your sexual identity or sexuality um there are some empirical studies that have shown that when people undergo those change efforts to change, and it's typically always from gay to straight, it's never from straight to gay, how I wish. That was also a possibility for some people. Um, uh, usually what happens is they stop engaging in same-sex behaviors, but the attractions and the desires are still there. No? So they still fall in love, except that they now stress themselves out by not allowing themselves to pursue relationships. That's as far as those uh, methods have shown. I should also mention that there is now some empirical evidence that shows that so-called conversion therapies uh, are not that effective in that sense, are not effective, but also they produce harm. They produce iatrogenic harm and um, the people who go through that usually end up with higher risk for uh, depression, anxiety disorders, as well as for suicide. So it's so in terms of the two criteria for treatments, quote unquote treatments, whether if it works and it's safe, it doesn't succeed in the first criterion, it doesn't work. And there is some evidence, a little evidence, that it might actually be harmful or unsafe. That's why in many parts of the world, it's now actually becoming also illegal to offer that quote-unquote service. Okay, cool. All right, so we got lots of questions here, but fortunately, due to time constraints, we're down to our last question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sure. Okay. That's na puto. Sorry po. Okay. All right. So, which do you think is harder to come out from the closet in our country? Being, uh, being gay or lesbian or being atheist? Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, rather. Okay. It's a, oh, it's, try to think of this as a beauty pageant question. Th this is a, actually, this is a gorgeous question. I don't think I've <laughs> ever been asked this question before. Yep. Hmm. They're both not illegal. So, I mean, you don't get any problems with the law. Um, 
<laughs> this is the kind of question I have to think about. Um, maybe I will answer it in, in, in two levels and try to unpack what we mean by coming out. For psychologists, coming out means two things. Coming out to yourself, one. You know, recognizing in yourself that this is part of you or this is who you are. And second is coming out to other people, telling other people, sharing that part of you to other people. I think if you probably grew up in a particular household, for example, a household that is very heteronormative or very religious, um, even coming out to yourself is probably going to be kind of, it's going to take a while or it's a journey, it's not an easy journey. And of course, coming out to others <laughs> will be also difficult, especially if they have those negative views. Um, I, I hesitate to answer one or the other um, because um, for many of us who are atheist and queer or atheist and LGBT, it doesn't make sense to, to kind of dissociate or disseparate. Those are part of who we are. It's an important part of who we are, our beliefs and non-beliefs, and our sexuality and our gender identities. So um, maybe that's a more interesting question, actually. What about those who people who are atheist and queer in a country where atheism and being queer is somehow stigmatized? That would, you know, you have our email, so you can refer them to us and we can help them out. Thank you very much. <laughs>